Thanks very much for such a lovely um, um, introduction. Good morning, everyone. Um, we've had to change the, the, the format and the, the presentations, but um, bear with us as we, 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 um, we juggle um, who's presenting next. So I'm going to be talking on advancing HIV vaccines into efficacy studies. And I'm going to speak mostly about promising candidates that are, are entering late stage um, um, efficacy. And um, you will see from my presentation that the time is ripe and the time is we are ready, the time is ready for, um, for HIV vaccine research and, research and we will be seeing some spectacular things happening in the next couple of years. So what do we need to end HIV? And to end HIV or the AIDS epidemic, we need to control viremia or infectiousness. And we can do this um, in, in a, in a multi-component way. And one would be to, to optimize the identif identification of people who are HIV infected and to rapidly link them into, um, into good and well-functioning treatment programs. So the test and treat strategy that not only um, seeks to find um, adults to put them onto treatment, but also tries to eliminate mother-to-child transmission and make sure that we, we tap into um, adolescents and, and other, uh, other networks where we may not find it easy to be tested and, and get access to care. If we can't prevent um, secondary transmission by reducing um, community viral load or infectiousness of, of, of individuals, and we need other strategies that would divert um, HIV acquisition. And this is the area where we need HIV vaccines and other interventions like microbicides and long-acting PrEP uh, to, to prevent, um, once exposed, uh, to prevent acquisition. And this is the focus of my talk today. But we also need to try and eliminate viremia from individuals, and that is why the, um, the cure agenda is critical in, in, in finding um, a way to end AIDS. Um, but of course, um, it's very important that in our multi-component um, strategy of test and treat, PrEP, um, we do find a, an effective and safe vaccine that we can deploy um, to everyone who needs it at a global level. So what have been the challenges for making HIV vaccines? And one of the biggest challenges has been scientific. This is a highly variable virus that integrates into the host genome and rapidly establishes latency, evading both humoral and cellular responses. But there's also been limited financial investment in HIV vaccine and HIV prevention, R&D. And we can see that from this, from this picture, you can see that the private sector and low and middle income countries um, have not contributed substantially to the endeavor to find HIV prevention interventions. And that most of the, 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 the heavy work or the heavy lifting have been done by the NIH. And in order to change this, we do need to make sure that private, the private sector, as well as our governments and our countries contribute um, and see the value of contributing to an R&D agenda that um, addresses HIV. So this lack of um, this, this, this scientific in, the, the scientific challenges and the lack of financial support has resulted in only four vaccine concepts that have been tested in six efficacy trials in the last 30 years. And I'm going to go, this is a busy slide and I'll take you through it. Um, it's a, a slide adapted from Nelson and, and, and Dan Baruch's um, um, overview on HIV vaccines and shows the four concepts and the six trials. And the first two concepts, the first, the first concept was a, um, looking at um, a protein, a GP120 with alum, either in IDUs or in MSM and high-risk women, which showed no um, vaccine efficacy. The second concept was a um, recombinant adeno gag pole nef that was conducted in, in the Americas and in South Africa um, and uh, looked at um, uh, whether, um, HIV, whether a vac this kind of vac vaccine could um, prevent HIV or reduce viral load. And these, these trials were halted early. Um, they were halted for, for fertility. And in the 502 or step, there was, there was evidence of initial increased um, acquisition in, in MSN who were uncircumcised and AD5 seropositive. In South Africa, we saw similar um, events where we saw a late increase in HIV infection, which was seen in unblinded males um, who were both circumcised and uncircumcised. The RV144, which tested the prime boost canary pox protein um, combination 
in heterosexual women um, and men in, in, with variable risk in Thailand was the first um, vaccine to show efficacy. At the 12-month period, um, there was, there was a vac the vaccine efficacy was over 50% at 60%, but this, w this waned um, rapidly to 31% at 42, at 42 months. And the last uh, concept that was tested in HVT and 505 was a prime with DNA and a boost with recombinant adeno, um, um, which looked at circumcised men with, who were AD5 negative. And this also was halted at the interim analysis. So you can see that there was a great surprise um, when we saw that the RV144 showed efficacy. And this is evident right from the beginning. The Kaplan-Meier separates right up front. And even though there is waning over time, um, we, we, you see that, that there is a distinct um, vaccine efficacy. And this was surprising because um, it took um, an enrollment of six, over 16,000 individuals to find 125 infections and to demonstrate um, this, this, kind of, um, this kind of efficacy. So a lot of, a lot of work post um, RV14 has, 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 has gone on to try and under, understand the, the mechanism of protection and some of the correlates of, of risk that are associated with, with HIV acquisition. And I think a very a nice illustrative um, uh, diagram is this one that shows the kinetics of, of the vaccine-induced immune responses um, um, based on RV144 and looks at ways of how to, to, to improve on this. So initially, we have a period um, in just with, with, the, with a period of, of vaccination where, where there's limited antibody and T-cell response. And in this period of time, you see um, very little um, vaccine protection. Obviously, as the antibody and T cell responses improve, um, vaccination uh, protection is at its best. And this rapidly wanes over, over a 12-month period. And, and you see that um, there is very limited effect um, beyond 12 months. And the idea for future programs would be to try and um, optimize or, or, or alter this waning durability. And this would be done possibly by looking at new, at, at new strategies, but also by boosting um, at a... At a um, at a 12-month period. And I'll discuss a little bit of that further as we talk about strategies for efficacy for, these, um, for, for other studies. So there, there were key, cor there were key um, correlates that, were, um, uh, that emerged from the RB144 that appear to be related to vaccine efficacy. And I'm going to deal mostly um, with the, the, the binding antibody to, to V1, V2. Um, and this was critical in the correlates um, of, of RB144. But we also saw that, um, that the, the magnitude um, and polyfunctionality of CD4 T cell, cell responses, particularly to, to HIV envelope, were also critical in, in, in vaccine efficacy. Um, we saw a, an, in a, um, a direct correlation between binding antibodies um, of, of plasma IgA to ARMF and HIV acquisition, and this has been studied further, but also an interplay, uh, a relationship between, um, a, a, between avidity, ADCC, and um, neutralizing antibodies um, in vaccinees um, who had low plasma IgA responses. So there's a very important, um, the, IgG, the IgG to V1, V2 has become very important, and particularly Ig3 um, to V1, V2 has been correlated with vaccine efficacy. This slide shows uh, participants who, who mounted, who had good um, V1, V2 responses, and you can see there's a low, medium, and high um, um, responses. And if you take a look at the Kaplan-Meier on your right, um, you will see that this directly correlates to efficacy and that participants who had good uh, V1, V2 responses um, were more likely to um, be protected um, after vaccination. So one of the strengths of the V1, V2 correlates is that the evidence from the SIM analysis has shown that antibodies to the crown loop of V2 exert genetic pressure on the virus, especially at the position 169. This region encompasses the alpha-4 beta-7 binding region, which is a very important attachment site for the virus and is found in high proportions of cells in the genital tract and so is critical for, for, for vaccine efficacy. Monoclonal antibodies from the RB4, RB144 vaccine recipients that are directed at the last scene at position 169 have been identified. Some analyses of those isolates from breakthrough isolates from vaccinees do not have this last scene from position 169 as compared to placebo recipients. And the VE for protection in this region 
approaches 80%. Of importance to me is that over 60% of clade C isolates possess this lysine at position 169, providing some optimism uh, for translating this correlate to the studies that we're going to be doing in South Africa um, and with the same kind of, 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 of same type of vaccine efficacy. So there was a lack of correlation between neutralizing antibodies and HIV acquisition in RV144. So all the circulating strains, um, the, the vaccine regimen failed to neutralize any of these at the time of during the course of the study. And so what we have in the post um, RV41, R, R144 world is a, um, is a conceptual framework that brings into bear um, the fact that non-neutralizing antibodies particularly with antibody functions like ADCC, ADCP and virion capture, as well as polyfunctional CD4 T cell response are associated with vaccine efficacy. And that neutralization was not the mechanism that protected against HIV acquisition. And that we'll see strategies um, that have built on these concepts and have formed the basis of the efficacy studies that, that we are taking forward. But besides the non-neutralizing HIV vaccine approaches, other things were happening in the neutralizing space. Advances in B cell technology have enabled the field to identify and isolate broadly neutralizing antibodies from persons with chronic HIV infection. And the passive transfer of these broadly neutralizing antibodies have demonstrated protection in non-human primates from experimental challenge. And this opens up a whole new vaccine approach either by utilizing these broadly neutralizing antibodies as passive immunogens or by or using this as a basis to, to produce new immunogen design. And so this leads us to three strategies um, that we see um, that will play out in the next 10 years to evaluate um, HIV vaccines. And one would be a clade C approach. The other one would be a multi-clade approach, both using non-neutralizing antibody approach to, to vaccination, and also then introducing a neutralizing antibody approach. And I will deal with two, two neutralizing antibodies. One is the VRCO1, and one is an interesting and um, a, a, a neutralizing body that's about to enter into manufacturing and, and clinical trials, and that is the CAP256. And so I'll deal with that um, in, 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 in that part of the, the, the lecture. But just to to, to take you back to the clade C um, strategy. So after the RB144 st uh, study was announced, um, a group of people called the P5 got together to plan how to f take the findings of RB144 and see whether they, we could demonstrate um, this kind of effect in other regions of the world, and particularly in clade C, where, where, where the, the epidemic is, is most devastating. And this led to a program, a licensure program, that um, looked at um, constructing the canary pox um, and make it clade C specific to construct a new bivalent protein and adjuvant it with MF59 in the hope of making it more potent, more durable, and then boost, boost this regimen at 12 months. And the whole hope was to optimize and increase the, the durability and potency of the, of the, of the um, vaccine. And so the strategy that we see in South Africa um, ha uh, is ongoing. Um, we have completed the HV10097, and this was, a, this was the Thai study, um, um, an exact Thai regimen um, conducted in uh, South Africa. Um, we've also um, uh, completed, the H we completed the enrollment in the HVT100, HVTN100, which is the, the phase one study that will allow us to, um, to decide whether we can go ahead and, um, and um, do a, a phase three licensure, licensure study, which we call 702. So looking back at, at 097, and this data I presented at, um, last year at, at R4P, but this, this, this slide just shows the comparison between 097, which happened in South Africa with the same Thai regimen, and, and RV144 that happened in Thailand. And you can see the response rates. And we're looking at the peak CD4 response rates, and we're also looking at the magnitude. And you can see the two different, um, the two different um, trials. And you can see that in South Africa, the response rate um, was 54 out of 78, so 70% of participants um, had, a, had a response rate as compared to 50% of, of the, tire, the tire participants um, at the envelope um, and um, at, at um, CD4s directed at the envelope. 
Looking at the V1, V2, which we said was very important earlier on, uh, looking at the, uh, the V1, V2 IgG responses between 097 and RV144, immediately you can see that um, the responses in the South Africans were excellent, both, um, both the prevalence um, and the magnitude, and also what was important in clade, oops, what happened there? My animation's not working, oh, there it is. Um, and looking at the, the clade A, um, and looking at the cross-clade response, and you can see also that very nice cross-clade response, um, even in clade A. So in terms of HV10100, I've already spoken to you about it, and this is a 250 phase one, phase two study. Um, it's fully enrolled, uh, the protocol chair is Linda Gale Becker. We hope to start getting the immunogenicity um, level um, assays uh, starting to run by mid-November. We hope to have the, the assays done um, by the end of March to help us inform the go-no-go no go criteria for, for the, um, the phase three study. So this is a, a vaccine program that we are incredibly excited about. When we started HV10100 in South Africa, um, there was a lot of um, um, excitement and, 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 and discussion and um, a, lot of, a lot of news coverage. But we have to meet the go-no-go no grow criteria to, to go on to 702. And these are the parameters we will be assessing in HV10100. And it's around looking at the prevalence of binding antibodies, to the, to the CLADE-C um, GP120 antigens, and we hope that that approaches 90%. We also want to look at the prevalence of V1, V1, V2 antibodies to CLADE-C, the CD4 T cell responses, and we've done some modeling. If we meet these kind of criteria, uh, we've done some modeling and we estimate, based on the RV144, if we meet these criteria, that we will have a vaccine efficacy of 50% at the two-year mark. This is the schema for 702. It's a 5,400 um, strong study. It, there will be two phases. A phase one will look for early durability, and a second phase that will look for, um, will, will for long-term efficacy or long-term durability. So there will be two stages, and um, we will evaluate um, the vaccine at, at the end of each stage. The, the next uh, strategy in, in the non-neutralizing non vaccine approach is a, is a, is, is a multi-clade or a global response. So I spoke firstly about a clade C approach, and um, the, the, the next phase is, uh, the next strategy would be looking at a, a global vaccine and a global response, and this, is, um, this, and this endeavor is from Janssen um, using the, the recombinant A26 MVA and GP140 primer. So this um, program uh, the, with partners of, from Janssen, Harvard, MHRP, RV, Reagan, and now recently NAID and HVTN will look at a, a, a strategy to, um, uh, to look at HIV protection against all clades um, at a global level. And this strategy um, is, is, is based on, on a, a potent prime um, using a vector, um, um, A26 vector, um, a, a um, inserts into the vaccine that have global coverage and also looking at novel um, and more potent um, envelopes that trauma, a trauma um, with, 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 with alum and having this strategy it's hoped that one could um, not have to um, tailor make vaccines for different regions but there would be one vaccine that would, would be applicable to the, the whole world. And so this program um, is busy um, being um, enacted with the hope of trying to identify the, the optimal regimen to go into efficacy studies in 2017. And the idea is to, is to prime with the, um, with the A26 vectors and then to, based on, your, on, on phase one, phase two data, is to down select your boost, um, um, either looking at AD26 or an MVA together with or without a, 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 the trimeric protein. And, this, um, and this, uh, this data is based on very compelling uh, non-human primer data generated by, by Dan. I'm going to show you um, data that he just published in Science, which looked at um, the A26 ARMF um, in rhesus macaques, macaques and looked at um, immunizing the macaques with, with AD and ARMF with ad alone and, and compared to sham, and you can see that there was a 90% reduction per exposure acquisition for the ad um, um, arm, um, that 50%, six out of the 12 monkeys um, were protected using the, the ad arm approach, um, and the correlates of, of protection um, were, um, were ELISA and, 
and, and antibody function and um, the neutralizing antibodies was not related to or predicted protection. So these are interrectal challenges and um, there have been some work done with female macaques with similar um, protections. So, um, so we do feel that this is a very good strategy to move forward and that the non-human primer data is very compelling and provides a good scientific basis to move forward. So moving on to neutralizing um, antibody approaches. Um, I'm sure throughout the conference you've seen um, pictures or varying pictures like this that show the various neutralizing antibodies in the areas of the envelope where they attach. Um, there's the V1, V2 uh, glycan, the V3 glycan, GP41, the GP120-41 interface, and the CD4 binding site of GP120 where the virus attaches to CD4. And I'm going to concentrate mostly on the V1, V2 and the, um, and the CD4 binding site. The only antibodies at the moment that have, that have reached the clinic um, are the VRC01 and 3BNC1117. So why, why would um, antibodies be important in prevention? We have heard a little bit in the conference that antibodies may be used for, for treatment and also may be used in the cure agenda. But for prevention, they provide a very compelling um, um, argument. Um, uh, you know, if we can prevent um, HIV infection in high-risk adults, that would be a huge boon and a huge um, important component to our toolkit. And I'll talk a little bit about the Antibody Mediated Prevention Study, AMP. Um, it would be important to know whether monoclonal antibodies could protect infants during childbirth and breastfeeding. We know that even though women are um, taking ARVs while they, they, while they are breastfeeding their infants, we still have um, transmission that is occurring, and this would be a mechanism of trying to eradicate um, breast milk transmission. We heard also in the conference that we could use this as a topical microbicide. Um, what we need to know is what are the levels of antibodies we need, how long the antibody would work, and uh, increasingly we're getting to hear the idea of putting these um, antibodies together in, in, in cocktails to prevent, uh, to, to increase breadth and potency. And, and it would be a good idea to, to put in um, cocktail uh, antibodies that had different um, actions and so that you would try and protect um, the, the, um, the person at all levels. It's important also here to note is that all the non-human primate studies that, um, we have, with that, that I will show you um, are with cell-free virus. And in humans, we know that there is cell-associated um, um, uh, transmission that occurs during sex and, and breast milk transmission. And one of the critical components of the studies that we'll be evaluating is how the impact of, of uh, neutralizing bodies on cell-associated transmission and the, the breastfeeding um, uh, um, transmission would be the best place to study that, as well as in, in heterosexual acquisition. So looking at the VRC01, which is your CD4, um, uh, which, which is your CD4 um, uh, uh, antibody, you can see that the, the neutralizing activity is very, is, 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 is very broad and very great, and that it, it has neutralizing ac activity in the lab um, against numerous clades, um, and, uh, including clade C, and in total, um, looking at 190 uh, viruses, uh, one saw um, 91 prote protection at the RC50 of less than 50 micrograms per mole. So a very promising um, 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 antibody, and um, that's, that's, that's ready for prime time. And it's supported again by non-human primate data, both in female and, uh, and, vagina, and, and, and male macaques, both rectal challenges and vaginal challenges. And here you see with a 20 milligram infusion um, uh, that there was protection um, um, after rectal and, and vaginal challenge. So the passive antibody prevention studies um, and the non-human primate studies tell us that, 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 that physiological achievable, achievable levels of antibodies could prevent HIV infection, but today we still don't have any direct proof in humans. Um, we need to learn from proof of concept and human, and human studies to understand better the mechanism of protection and whether um, neutralizing antibodies can protect, um, heter het um, can protect um, uh, against sexual acquisition. And so um, it's, very, it's very exciting to know that, they, that towards the end of this year, a, a very ambitious um, study um, um, both by, um, conducted both by the HPTN and the HPTN called AMP um, will, will, will start enrolling 
in MSM in the Americas and in heterosexual women um, in the Clade C areas are starting 2016 in the Americas and hopefully early next year in southern Africa. And so this is just a, the logo of the AMP study um, and this is just to, to, to emphasize that this is a collaboration between the HPTN and the HVTN. So coming to um, a very interesting uh, neutralizing antibody and this is CAP256. Um, this, uh, this was identified by a South African team, um, Croatia was, was on the team, and it, it identified a very potent V1, V2 broadly neutralizing antibody. And this was from an acute infection cohort where about seven, seven participants developed antibody responses which were able to neutralize more than 40% of circulating viruses. And this slide just shows um, how potent um, the, the, the CAP256 is, and this, is just comp this, this slide compares um, CAP256 to, to VRCO1, um, to um, PG9, and to other 1008, and you can see that, that although um, are the, uh, very potent and, um, and, they are, and um, although not as broad as VRCO1, but much more, much more potent than VRCO1. Important too to note is that the um, non-human primate challenges um, done with CAP256 show that at the 0.4 milligram per kilogram and the 2 milligram per kilogram um, levels is that this CAP256 um, uh, protected against non-human primate uh, uh, challenge. And so this is very, very compelling and very exciting data. Based on this data, um, the Caprisa team are, are envisaging a, a subcutaneous uh, um, neutralizing antibody approach to protect uh, women in, 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 in southern Africa and um, clinical development, uh, GMP manufacturing, and um, hopefully um, rapidly a, a, a clinical trial to evaluate uh, this in, in high-risk women in, in South Africa. The important thing, um, the critical link between AMP and other neutralizing antibodies um, and immunogen design will be in defining the levels of neutralization required to achieve protection. And this, these studies will set the standard for developing immunogens that achieve those levels of antibodies um, in, in active vaccination. And this is, this is evidenced by recent articles that are coming out that are showing that um, the, inter the interlock and the sudden the emergence of, 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 of good envelope immunogens that are now um, starting to neutralize antibodies to levels that we haven't seen before. So this is a very exciting um, field and we look forward to, to um, evaluating um, these envelope traumas in, in studies and, see, and, and to assess the kind of levels of of neutralizing they get and whether these could protect against infection. And so we do have our work cut out for us. Um, we do need to deliver um, ARV treatment en masse, which includes implementing highly effective programs to eliminate mother-to-child transmission. We do need to develop long-acting pre-exposure prophylaxis strategies that can be used both topically and systemically for both men and women. And we do need to develop highly effective strategies to develop HIV acquisition and this includes vaccines, um, novel ways to administer broadly, and novel ways to, to administer broadly neutralizing um, antibodies. And so what do we need to remember? Okay, so I don't need to tell you is that we have an awful and ravaging epidemic um, that has devastated our lives and the lives of our community. Um, but I also need to tell you is that the, the vaccine field is ripe at this moment for impact. And this would not have been possible without the enormous dedication um, of scientists, clinicians, participants, and communities. And it's very important to note that our communities where we work are critical um, in this endeavor and have been highly supportive of all the programs that we have. And this is um, to acknowledge uh, our communities and our participants for all, the, for all their, um, for, 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 for being there with us and, and doing this, this process hand in hand. I'd like to acknowledge um, a whole host of people who, um, who, who helped me uh, with slides and had lots of discussions.